so much for choosing Morning Live. Now, as the world observes World Telecommunications and Information Society Day, the Telecommunications Department will use this day to activate internet connectivity. And it's using Orlando West Secondary School to raise awareness and also highlight how ICT can bridge societies and economies. And this is a joint project between Telcom and the Ministry. Telecommunications and Postal Services Minister Stellan Dabeni Abrams joins us now to talk about this project and of course other matters related to the department. Minister, good to see you. Thanks for coming through. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. Good morning to the viewers at home. It's of course an exciting day, you know, uh, telecommunications and of course connectivity have basically taken over our lives. Not sure what we would do without it. But with that said, looking at how this day will be observed and commemorated today, let's talk about this event that's taking place at Orlando West High. Why did you choose that particular school? especially against a backdrop where people would say the urban areas are always the ones that are catered to. Why did you choose this specific school? Well, you will remember that when President Ramaphosa delivered his State of the Nation address, he mentioned the fact that we're going to lead the fourth industrial revolution. That therefore meant that we've got to make sure that there's digital inclusivity. And that therefore meant that we need to shift away from making sure that the people that have access to Internet are the ones in the urban areas, but make sure that every South African has access to Internet. And of course, Soweto is part of South Africa. And therefore now you're asking specifically why the specific Orlando West High School? Because of the the history that it, it, it enjoys, of course, not just because it's Soweto, but to say everybody in Soweto feels like they've been deprived of what they are, they are supposed to be enjoying. But to say we can start here and therefore take the program to, to other townships and therefore the rural areas and the villages that I come from. And uh, we live in a time where the economy is always top of mind because how difficult it is for most South Africans. We talk about the cost of data and the question then becomes who is paying for uh, this particular project today, given that you are in partnership with Telcom? Well, this project is paid for by Telcom, as we have had that uh, we're in partnership. One of the things that we do as the department is to leverage on partnerships to utilize the universal service obligation at times. At times, we utilize the CSIs to say, how can we make sure that instead of us as, as the ICT sector or industry, we don't just go around giving soccer kits? But we make sure that we do that, that that is our core, which is connecting people. Therefore, we partnered with Telcom to say as they roll out fiber, because one of the things that we have seen is that people want to roll out fiber in urban areas, as we have said. But the quality of the connectivity that gets to be expanded in townships and, and rural co uh, communities is always not the best quality, because people are looking at, at the profitable issues. And now we're saying... Before profits, quality and service. Because once you, you make sure that the services that you render are available to our people, are accessible, the demand is going to be driven automatically. They deserve the best, like the people in center. So let's talk about what this will practically mean for the pupils, uh, the learners, the teachers, and of course the community around that school. What will this project mean for them? This project means that now the communities and the students of, of, of Orlando West High School, they're now becoming part of the world. In most cases, we're talking about bridging the digital divide. Now they have access to the educational content, but not only that. This is a, 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 a platform whereby we also make sure that even parents have access to monitor the kind of schoolwork and the behavior in terms of, of, of the educational content that their children go through. But most importantly is the fact that we're trying to kill two birds with one stone. We don't have much resources to make sure that we can build community centers outside the, the cyber labs that we provide at schools. So we're saying we're utilizing this platform. Alando West High now will be an, an opportunity for those that are in school. The, the learners, but at the same time, in the afternoon, we're opening a university whereby we're saying the community must have access to the curriculum that we have developed working with the Department of Higher Education and other international part partners. We have a responsibility to provide digital literacy to all. Therefore, going to Soviet Orlando, Orlando West High School, putting that cyber level that I spoke about, but the content does not limit to high school learners. But it's a content that is available for high school, but also made provision for the communities. So what is the bigger picture thinking here? What's the strategy going forward? Is this going to be limited to this school, or is there a plan to expand this? And if so, where, when, and how? Well, Gail, we're going big with this. It's going to be a national project, as I've said. It's a national project. We're starting... This is the beginning. 
with Soweto High. Uh, well, we've been to the Eastern Cave uh, in April, where we did some in Dabangulu, but we are planning to roll out as much as we can. But what we're doing, as I said, we spoke of the issues of resources, which is very important that we make sure that we coordinate all the efforts by the industry so that by the time we come on board as government, we know exactly that at least in this financial year we can roll out 50,000 or 20,000 cyber labs in South Africa. Of course, we have 27,000 schools, so it won't be 50,000. So to say this is what we'll be doing in partnership with other external partners, but most important to say from the government perspective, how do we make sure that we create a conducive environment for the private sector to be able to help us achieve the objectives that we want to achieve, those of, bu of building the digital society that we talk about. So you're going to be seeing lots of these initiatives throughout the country. So this is going to happen in all schools across the country? Yes, ma'am. By when? Well, I can't put by when. That, that's why I spoke of coordination earlier, because I said it's, we're leveraging on partnerships. Now what we're doing is to engage with all the industry players to see what value can they add. We've tapped also into the banking facilities. But of course, we would like, as we've put as, 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 as a target as the department, to say at least by 2030, let's make sure that all South Africans are, are connected. Remember, we also have a responsibility to drive the fourth industrial revolution. And we cannot do that if people do not have access to technology and connectivity. So the more we broaden our space in terms of bringing more partnerships, the shorter the period that we can say in five years or three years we'll be able to do it. So with that said, though, you know, um, one of the issues is, of course, that the president is about to appoint a new cabinet. And there's always an issue with continuity. So we'll probably have, who knows, a new Minister of uh, Communications. We'll probably have a new Minister of Education. How then, you know, are there any measures in place to ensure that the project actually continues beyond the individuals driving it right now? The good thing is that this is the presidential project. He remains the president even in, in this sixth administration. That's why when I quoted earlier, I said this is what he said during his State of the Nation address. It's not what we have to do or we would like to do. It's what the president has committed to, to this nation, including the governing party. If you read the manifesto, these are the things that we spoke about, that gone are the days where our children must not be exposed to the technologies and we've got to make sure that we broaden the space. Therefore, this is the commitment that has been made to the people of South Africa, irrespective of who occupies the seat in, in communications education let's talk about uh, uh, DTT uh, dis digital terrestrial television and our migration that has been scuppered time and time again we've missed several deadlines what is the state of play right now well the status play is that now we faced with a challenge for example that we have lots of boxes in our warehouse we've been calling upon south africans the deserving ones those that have a household income of less than 3200 to go and register in their post offices so that we can have the database and they can access the boxes. That's the first thing. There's been a low uptake of the boxes. The Before second you go one, on to the next one, if I may just interject there on uh, the low uptake and the boxes that are sitting in warehouses. There was, of course, reports that uh, quite a bit of money was lost through boxes that were now not compliant or were somehow defective one way or another. How much did you lose uh, to that sort of situation with these set-top boxes? Well, what we did when we discovered that, we said uh, to the responsible agency, which, which is USASA, that contracted the service provider, we said, talk to your service providers. We're not going to be penalized as government. Of course, we had to go to court. We've won all of those cases in court. So it's them that are paying us. What we're doing now is to make sure that they are compliant in everything. That's why we have strengthened the monitoring of, of, of the implementation in terms of the installations. Because one of the challenges that we faced was the fact that we get installers coming from Joburg going to install in the Eastern Cape. Now when the box is faulted, there's nobody to come and fix it. So we said to the agency, go back, make sure that you can, you can then procure or make sure that you contract local installers so that immediately there's a crisis. The beneficiary is able to, to, to be attended to, but most importantly, that the one that was contracted is able to fix the mess. We can't be fixing the mess of the people who are enjoying the spin-offs of the work that we so are doing. So the department as hasn't incurred any losses Not in at that all, regard? Except right. for the legal costs, as I said. So when are we likely then to make that switch in its entirety? We have started with first aid uh, that we are hoping that we're going to switch off before the end of this year because you will understand one thing about migration is that you have to be ready as ACBC fast. 
because we may want to switch off tomorrow. But if SABC is not ready to open up those platforms, then it means that people won't be watching. And the real reason why we're saying there's a need for us to have broadcast, I mean migrate the broadcasters from the analog platform, is to create more content, is to create more jobs, but most importantly, provide high-quality television to people. Therefore, it is, it's a balanced way. We need the broadcasters on board. All those, your ETV, your SABC and others, they must be on board so that by the time we switch off, the services and the content is available. We are having a platform, of course, I've got a group of advisors uh, that include uh, or every broadcaster that says, Minister, we're prepared to work with you. That's why I said we're starting with Free State. But now what we are doing also is to identify the crucial areas where the spectrum bands are congested in to say because we also have to release the spectrum for those that are in the mobile sector. So what is the latest progress report? Is the SABC able to meet those obligations given the financial constraints that the organization faces? We have faith that the SABC will be able to meet the obligations. The dedication that has been shown to us by the board and the management gives us hope that indeed with our assistance and treasury, SABC is up to the task. Speaking of treasury, I saw Minister Tito Mbomeni was here yesterday. We're still waiting for money as the SABC BC minister and I'm sorry you thought, the money? and I'm sorry you thought that the minister has delivered the money I, I, I was hoping you came in here we've got you know, with the boxes. money all right well the minister was here to check because of what happened in the studios and as I said that uh, we're very concerned also because there are other people that were injured and as the, as, as government we really want to relay our messages to say well with them we will be visiting one that is in ICU but most importantly ours is to say how do we fast track the process but of course without skipping any regulatory mechanism because that's one thing that we need to focus on as much as we are in a rush to say that serve SABC we've got to make sure that we followed all the processes this is the taxpayers money but it is in our interest to make sure that SABC survives and thrives in everything that they do that's why we committed that we'll be giving SABC money the COO was here yesterday and when asked about that financial situation he said that of course the meetings had taken place but the guarantees had been issued but that's not a done deal because you still need to convince the financial institutions about the viability of uh, these loans so What's the latest that you know as far as this money is concerned? If the COO told you that information, that means that's, the, that's what is the status is. Unfortunately, I'm from Rwanda, so what happened between yesterday and today I have not received. But I do know that there's a commitment and the engagements were done with the banks, as you said. Now we are waiting the Minister, the minister of, of Finance to give a go-ahead. All right. Uh, let's talk ICASA for a moment, you know, policy, regulations, all those sorts of things. Now, two weeks ago, the regulator, they actually threatened uh, to take court action against you. And uh, they gave you a deadline demanding their annual allocation uh, actually be given to them. And you were blamed for interfering uh, with uh, some of uh, the funding there, withholding funds from ICASA. Uh, how, that situation, how was that resolved? Probably let's start here. Do you know any minister that has the responsibility to transfer funds to any entity? According to your understanding of the responsibilities of the minister? No. All right. Then I wouldn't interfere with that process. That's administrative. The second question is how was it resolved? I do not know. I'm still waiting for the court action. I have nothing to do with transfers of money. Just like I do with SABC, mine is to make sure that I go and plead the entity's case to parliament and the treasury based on the requirements that are required by the funding organization. Did you and have that? any differences, though, with ICASA, the board, with regard to uh, some issues, processes that needed to unfold uh, that perhaps got you to say, maybe hold on before funds are released? Let me correct you again. I never said hold on before the funds are released. Probably we may have ICASA to come and clarify what did the minister do to interfere. Because in my own knowledge and my department's knowledge, there's nothing that said the minister said don't hold funds. So why were the funds not released? What's your understanding of that as the minister? Actually, Nam, I still want to know. I was shocked when I saw the press so statement. So you don't know? I don't know. You can ask the accounting officer. I'm not the accounting officer. Mine is to approve what? That, that is supposed to come to me. And I play the part in that. If, ICASA, if there's an issue on ICASA APP, mine is to raise the concern in terms of alignment. But who transfers the funds and when? That's the responsibility of the So did you raise concerns authority. then? On what? On the alignment that you just spoke about. Definitely, I have to. I'm sure you have seen the letters that have been circulated. So was that the reason why the funds were not released? There is no rule 
that says when the minister raises concern on an APP, the funds must not be transferred. That's why I'm saying I don't understand what led to that. So the communication that you got from ICASA threatening that court action, firstly, let me ask, did you receive the communication? I didn't, actually. That's why I said I had it over a press conference. I was in San Francisco. So you don't know about that? It I wasn't read about directly it, on you. and then a day later, we got the correspondence, and I asked, where do I fit in all of this? Do you have anything, probably, that you were informed that the minister instructed the department not to transfer? But I don't know, as I'm saying. Ikasa is better pleased to tell you why they thought that it is the minister that has withheld the funds. Fair enough. But did you have any communication with the department with regard to the funding to Ikasa? That's the same question that I, I, I answered earlier, that I never had. I see you have an interest in that. I never had any communication. That's why I wanted to know what happened where do I feature as the minister in the transfer of funds? Is there an allegation or an assumption that the minister had told the officials not to transfer the funds? Do you believe that to be the case, that there was an assumption or an allegation? I don't know. I mean, like, if people stand up and say, we're going to take the minister to court for interfering, it means there's something they know that I don't, which is why I didn't even bother to respond, because I was like, okay, I'm going to hear what's the issue. Where did I say it? So the minister never interfered, never said anything, and didn't do anything uh, with regard to that particular funding that did not go to ICASA. But w what was your understanding then from the department as to why those funds were not released? I, I don't even want to know. My issue but you was should want to, to know, minister. Listen, Garlok. My issue is there's ICASA that goes on media to say the minister has interfered, therefore we're taking her to court. And of course, the minister that I am, Stella and Abin Abrams, is to say, oh, okay, let them go to court. I want to say, what's the issue? Because they're in the PFMA and everywhere else, there's no way it says, I can give a go-ahead or not of transfer of funds. But secondly, I have not, I repeat this, I have not given any instruction to anyone not to transfer funds. Because that's not my responsibility. It's not I know in most cases... Everybody believes that we're so eager to interfere with the processes. But let me assure you, this minister here is very clear of her powers and functions and what she can do and what she can't. So what was the department's explanation to you as to why they did not release the funds? They said because ICASA has not responded to the letter that the minister wrote to them to say they must engage with the accounting officer. It was the letter you're asking me about, if I had correspondence with them, it was the letter that was raising issues on the APP, and I did say... Please liaise with the accounting officer so that the matter can be resolved. Just a final one on uh, the spectrum policy. You spoke about um, the fourth industrial revolution, and of course, this will be key to that. And uh, according to, for example, a service provider like Vodacom, they launched 5G in Lesotho, and uh, because it is said South Africa's spectrum policy is a mess. So, uh, you know, uh, South Africa's spectrum policy is a mess. If you yes, can take uh, me this is why we haven't been able to roll out 5G yet, and they were able to do that in a country like Lesotho. That's what so, Vodacom says. So, what's your, what's your take on. You know, I want to understand is this what Vodacom says? That uh, well, South well there are reports is a mess? that uh, the reason why it was easier to roll it out in Lesotho is because our spectrum policy is a bit of a mess. I wouldn't respond to that because I do not know of any policy that is a mess, but of course probably they do know how messy it is. But I do know that the policy directive was issued by the former minister. He had consultations. When I joined, I did the same, trying to understand what were the concerns between, from the industry and the policymaker. And I went back to them to say, let's talk, what's your understanding of the role when we're going for licensing in spectrum policy? And we went there, we engaged, and of course, out of that, the minister is going to issue the final policy direction on spectrum. I'm not sure if it's a mess. Definitely you know that we are after elections, we're waiting for the new administration to come. So when the new administration takes over, then the policy directive will be in place. Fair enough, but where are you leaving it? Are you leaving it at a point where the new minister would be in a position to step in and say, we are ready to I'm issue very here. ready, actually. Very ready. But I'm sure now if I do it, she will be saying she wants to sort her things out before she leaves. And I don't want that. 
mine is in the interest of the country i've got to make sure that i play my part so that i've even prepared the close-up report to say whoever comes on board tomorrow the following day or the two days later when she has satisfied herself or himself with the directive that i've finalized she can say i'm ready south africans i'm issuing therefore we'll be gazetting the following day you're hoping to come back in this portfolio definitely i am hoping to come back because i feel like there's a lot that i have to do but of course it's the prerogative of the president it certainly is. Telecommunications and Postal Services Minister Selanda Beni Abrams on uh, the symbolic activation of how the investment in fiber will help benefit communities in order to support bridging of the gap within the communications and information technology and uh, the economy in societies and also other issues related to her portfolio. With that, we apologize for going to news late, but Leanne has that.